How and why does racial inequality continue to divide us? Chris Hayes will be here to talk about his new book, A Colony in a Nation. I would hope that people who consider themselves constitutional conservatives that revere the Tea Party could recognize something that resonates with their own worldview. Just how big an influence was David Letterman on late night TV? Jason Zinneman will join us to talk about his new biography, Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night. I wanted to write a book that really mixes criticism and reporting in a way that foregrounds the reporting so that people who don't know Letterman will like it as much as people who are obsessive about it will like it. Jenny Schusler will give us an update from the literary world. Plus, we'll talk about what we and the wider world are reading. This is Inside the New York Times Book Review. I'm Pamela Paul. Chris Hayes joins us now. He is the host of All In with Chris Hayes on MSNBC, and he has a new book out, A Colony in a Nation, reviewed this week on the cover of the book review. Chris, thanks for being here. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. All right. Let's start with the title, A Colony in a Nation. Tell us what that means and what you mean by a colony in a nation. The line comes from a phrase in a Richard Nixon 1968 speech. It's almost a sort of throwaway line about how black people want the same as white people. They don't want to be a colony in a nation. And it struck me in a moment that I was doing a lot of reporting on policing, and particularly at Ben Ferguson, that, you know, in some ways that's kind of the system we've created. And, and, and the way that I mean it is that the subjective experience of policing in large parts of the country is the kind of experience of policing you would expect in a free, open society. And then in what I call the colony, among people of color particularly, but not exclusively, but in huge swaths of the country, people experience policing much more the way that you would expect to experience policing in a police state or a occupied uh, land. The, the, the interactions with state authority are incredibly tense, constant, disruptive. There's this sense in which the law is king before you in the, in the moments in which you're in their presence. And I think if you don't have the routine experience of that, it can be hard to get your head around just how routine and common that is among our fellow citizens. Did you ever think you would name the title of one of your books after a quote from Richard Nixon? (laughs) You know, it's funny you say that because actually the funny thing about Richard Nixon, having gone back and spent a lot of time with his rhetoric in the 60s and 70s, is that in his own way, he was quite gifted rhetorically. Um, This is something that in Rick Perlstein's biographies of Nixon comes through, that he, he had a real knack rhetorically for sort of saying it without saying it. If you read his speeches, there, there's a lot of, he's constantly at pains rhetorically to kind of show that he's not a racist or not a, you know, these aren't dog whistles. And we're sort of open towards all, we believe in equality, but he was very good at sort of cultivating the message he wanted to cultivate among who he wanted to cultivate with the language he used. He could speak with two different layers at the same time. Absolutely. Yeah, it was a real, real skill of his. Was it during Ferguson that you came up with this framework? You know, it was in Ferguson, I think. You know, I'm you know, I'm a, a white kid who grew up in the Bronx. My experience in New York has always been extremely diverse and it's also been an experience where I was growing up during periods of high crime and also understood that like policing was disparate. I understood that as a concept. It was in Ferguson just the experience there, the kind of almost revolutionary fervor in the eyes and voices of the people I talked to, that just this incomprehensible levels of rage, frustration, humiliation, that I really just came away thinking about this idea of like the cops there really did feel like occupiers. That that was the, the that was the concept and phrase that kept running through my head. And I remember reading the Department of Justice Patterns and Practices report for the Cleveland Police Department, in which one of the investigators finds a, a sign in the vehicle bay of a Cleveland precinct that is in a, a poor black neighborhood that, that labels it forward operating base which is the term that, you know, the military uses for remote locations in enemy land. And I just kept thinking about how much of policing exists under these conditions that are like occupation. And that was, that idea was sort of in my head as I started to think about writing it and when I encountered the Nixon quote. Just to state the obvious, you are a college-educated white person. In writing the book, did you think, coming from that perspective about what you could bring to the subject? Yeah, a lot. And in fact, in the beginning, I didn't want to write about this topic because it felt like I, I'm, I'm clearly not the best person to write about the first person experience of this kind of policing or even a document. It. And there's been dozens of incredible writers, particularly writers of color, who have written about this in all sorts of different ways. There are two reasons I decided to write the book. One is that 
I think one thing that could happen is that white people think that certain issues are like race issues, like there are issues that are in like some category on the website called civil rights right. or race, like policing and justice, like and, and even people that are sympathetic in a kind of abstract sense, like, oh, yeah, I'm against police brutality or uh, we lock up too many people. I'm against mass incarceration. Like there's this idea that it's like some other people's issues or it's in some silo or category as opposed to like actually an immediate crisis for all of us as citizens in the Democratic Republic, and particularly as citizens who are active citizens, who are involved in choosing our leaders, but who are not suffering the consequences of the system that's been built. So I felt like it's actually necessary to pull the topic and the issues out of any kind of box you might put in it for other people to write about. And second of all, I felt like my own experiences that I could help to contribute to the conversation in looking not just at what the impacts of the system are, which a lot of people have written masterfully about with more years of experience than I, but to look into how it was and why it was we built it. That to me is kind of the crucial, I think, hopeful contribution and that why did we make it? <laughs> why mm-hmm. did we build this system and how do we unmake it? And it seems very deliberate that you start off your book in the first person and you start off with a question. When was the last time you called the cops? Why did you start it that way? I wanted the book to be conversational. I wanted to draw readers into thinking about their own interaction with the police. And I wanted to sort of start with like the point of friction, which is How do we view the police? What do we want them to do? What are you doing when you call the cops? What is the task that you as a citizen are essentially assigning them in the moment you call? And then extend that out more broadly. What tasks are we as citizens assigning the police? Because that gets to the heart of the matter in many ways about, I think, some of the problems and perversions of policing as we have constituted it, which is that we want the police to do everything. And you share a very personal anecdote about your own experience with the police at the 2000 Republican convention. Tell us that story. Yeah, I I showed up. I went to the 2000 RNC in Philadelphia with my then girlfriend, now wife, and her father, who was a political reporter covering it. And we thought it'd be fun to kind of take it in as spectators. And I accidentally forgot that I had about $30 worth of marijuana in a bag that was in my eyeglass case. And when we got to security, we went through several checkpoints. And the last one, a police officer searched my bag and he found it. And he sort of whipped around and put his back to me and talked to his two fellow officers. And after a few minutes, he put the bag back down. And I took it and I thought they were going to arrest me. But instead, I just walked in and walked into a bathroom and, you know, there were there was my weed. And I compare that with an experience that someone I interviewed, a young man uh, who was a debate coach on the west side of Baltimore, a young black man who came very close to getting arrested for something he hadn't done while a teenager. And the kind of just incredible latitude and forgiveness that I was shown and what that says about the broader system. I mean, that that story, a lot of people have heard that story, and particularly among African-American audience members are just like, I cannot believe that they let you go. It just seems like it's it's beamed from another planet. You go back and trace these contradictions, this hypocrisy to the colonial era. What are the roots of the way we think about this, a sort of two systems of justice? You know, it's it's foundational in, in the sense that I argue in the book that in many ways a revolution was fought over policing, and it was fought over the enforcement of customs law through customs officers who were tasked by the king to crack down on smuggling and to extract revenue. And that meant search and seizure over wider and wider swaths of the population. Every boat would be pulled over. It was what I call the first stop and frisk era. And the founding fathers found this enraging and humiliating. It produced mob violence in response in which customs officers would be beaten and tarred and feathered, and mobs would break into customs houses and steal back confiscated contraband. And it even shows up in the Declaration of Independence when Thomas Jefferson writes of the king in his his sort of bill of particulars that he has sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. I mean, that is a police complaint. That's a complaint about the humiliation, the harassment at the hands of law enforcement. So much of what you talk about, it, there are these loaded terms that it sounds like there are very different ways in, of interpreting them in the colony versus in the nation. Talk about the idea of, of victimhood and, and victimization and how that plays out differently in the colony versus the nation. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that happens 
is that the conception of law and order politics n- divides the world into criminals and victims, and particularly a certain kind of very racist law and order rhetoric. It's that the criminals are black and the victims are white, and that's mm-hmm. an old tradition going back to the antebellum South, particularly in Reconstruction and Redemption and the lynching period. The fact is that most crime in America is committed intra-racially. White people are victimized by white people, black people are victimized by black people, and violence and victimization rates are extremely unequal even across the same city. And we know this, right? And it gets turned into this sort of strangely disingenuous argument about, quote, black on black crime. But really the the levels of, of crime victimization in neighborhoods that are poorly served is in some senses just a different side of the same coin of the reduced value of black lives. And you see this in things like homicide clearance rates. There's an amazing book called Ghetto Side by Jill Ovi, which has gotten a lot of attention that sort of talks about the ways in which the system doesn't clear, doesn't catch murderers when the victims are young black men in, in certain kinds of neighborhoods. They're essentially the state's monopoly of violence is broken down. And that that's a failure of the state. And it's a failure also of our taking seriously the value of the lives that are lost there. And that's on a continuum with the kinds of things we see in, say, police shootings of unarmed young men of color, as opposed to in opposition to them. It's, it's, it's part of the same phenomenon about the sort of distinct regimes that we have. A few other terms very weighted, the ideas of justice, punishment, accountability, vengeance. How do these play out again in this system I think vengeance is an interesting one because mm-hmm. I think and punishment particularly. I think that one of the things that really characterizes American justice system is is a very vengeful punishing instinct. And that has to do with race, but it's not just about race. Like American punitiveness is both inextricably bound with its racial history but also exists in entirely race-neutral environments, right? So like the Scarlet Letter, for instance, (laughs) has this foundational text of American punitiveness, right? And right now, this punitiveness, this punitive impulse, is it's going to be very interesting to see how it plays out through the system in the midst of the opioid crisis, because that's largely being experienced most intensely in white areas. And there's a question about whether we're going to see a kind of more empathetic approach to it or whether those same punitive impulses are going to be there. And I I think it's an open question. I think that our our twin impulses towards empathy and punishment tend to to be activated depending on how close (laughs) we think the perpetrator is to us. People have a lot of empathy towards someone they know and, and not much towards someone that they don't. And there's an open question about how that empathy or punitive impulse gets channeled in terms of opioids and how it can get channeled to sort of reform the system more broadly. It seems like we have just lost the idea of rehabilitation. It's sort of disappeared from public rhetoric. Absolutely. I mean, that's that's a sort of policy fact that various sort of historians of the prison system have written about. I mean, like actually and literally like removed from even statutory guidelines for like what prisons are supposed to do. But we have 100 percent lost the idea of it. And we have to me, more profoundly, you know, we move the object of our concern from crime to criminals, from acts to essences. And that captures it to me. You know, when someone says someone's an offender or someone has a rap sheet, we're saying that what kind of person they are in an essential way, which is in tension with and contradicts the impulse towards rehabilitation. Rehabilitation is predicated on the belief that people do a thing. It's the it's the act they have done that must be punished, held to account. And then through the punishment system, the person is brought to a place where they won't do an act like that again. <laughs> and that idea is basically gone. I mean, what's, what's, what's replaced it is that there's a class of people that are criminals who need to be kept away from everyone. There's a very sharp divide, obviously, that you write about between the colony and the nation. And the book is coming out at a time of intense partisan division. In all likelihood, this is the kind of book that would be picked up by a liberal readership. But I'm curious to hear, what would you want a liberal reader who probably approaches this book sympathetic to the argument? What would you want them to glean from this book that they might not have thought of before reading it? I think that one of the ideas behind the book is that the appeal of the politics, law, and order are much more universal than maybe we 
want to recognize. I grew up in a city where white liberals elected Rudy Giuliani mayor on a promise that wasn't that different from the promise Trump was offering his voters, which was to make New York great again, to, you know, restore order, to arrest decline, to make sure that the malefactors and the predators were put in their place and kept away so that you could safely and securely flourish. And so I think the answer to that question is I want people to recognize how much their own buttons can be pressed by this. And if they feel like the system's unjust, to operationalize that and understand that their participation in politics, particularly at the local level where this system has been made more than at any other level, it's not a federal system, it's largely locally made, local prosecution elections, state reps, city council members, mayors, etc., that they should vote and activate themselves as citizens in opposition to the kind of worst impulses of white fear. Now, it doesn't often happen that people today read books that clearly represent an opposing view. But let's say someone like Sean Hannity from the complete opposite side of the political spectrum picked up a book like this. What would you, in an ideal world again, hope that someone like him would take away from reading it? You know, the the second chapter of the book in some ways is written precisely with that audience in mind, because the second chapter, which is about our founding fathers and the colonial generation, is, is trying to make an argument that the kind of policing that we have in this country would not be tolerated by the founders, and that it's it's actually a violation of our some of our most cherished conservative principles, resistance to state coercion and and tyranny. So I, I would hope that people who consider themselves constitutional conservatives, who proudly wave the Gadsden flag of the coiled snake saying, don't tread on me, that revere the Tea Party, could recognize in the complaints of people who are under this regime of policing something that resonates with their own worldview. One last question, because your book sort of comes out on the brink of books that were either completed before the election or after. And I'm curious if you had written this entirely before the November elections, and then if you had the opportunity to go back and change things. So it was basically finished before the election. I probably could have changed things and chose not to, because I think the book is very much about the forces at work that elected Donald Trump, Mm -hmm. (laughs) even though he's only named once. So it didn't seem to me that it was in any way rendered irrelevant or outdated. All right. Chris Hayes, author of A Colony in a Nation. Chris, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. The book again is A Colony in a Nation by Chris Hayes, reviewed this week on our cover. Jason Zinneman joins us now. He is the comedy critic for The New York Times, and he has a new book out this week, Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night. Jason, thanks for being here. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. So I'm going to make a confession right at the beginning so everyone knows where I stand, which is that I have never seen David Letterman. (laughs) Is that a terrible thing to confess? Is that a crime in your eyes? Not at all. Not at all. Not at all. Well, hopefully I I will represent those among the listeners here who have also not seen Letterman and will ask all the dumb questions that people who don't know why there's an entire book about him would want to know. So let's just start off with why did you want to write a book about him? I worshipped David Letterman as a kid. He's one of these people who I love before I thought like a critic. And I do believe that you love things as a kid in a deep way that you don't love things as an adult. And to a large degree, I think my sense of humor was defined by David Letterman. I, when I was a kid, I talked like him. I, my, my sense of sarcasm was came from him. Even as an adult, I can sort of see traces of it. I was going to say, maybe people who've seen David Letterman can detect it in your voice right now. <laughs> yes, man, I think I think it was funny. I was recently talking to my wife about the when we first started dating and we were emailing back and forth and, you know, it's that moment when you're trying to be, like, charming or flirtatious and have other person like you. And she said, do you want to go dancing? And I said, in, this is over email, sure, only if it's the lambada, the forbidden dance. Now, people can disagree over whether that's charming or, or, or successful, <laughs> but I would put a direct line between David Letterman and me thinking that's funny. <laughs> and presumably your wife thought it was funny, too. Uh, I think she was baffled by it, but, you know, we, I, I made my way past it. <laughs> well, maybe I would like David Letterman. I do think that's funny. So he was, again, for people who've never seen him or don't know who he is, who is David Letterman? 
David Letterman is a Indiana-born broadcaster who got the job to host Late Night with David Letterman after Johnny Carson and really revolutionized the talk show in the 80s. Now, you know, there's so many late night talk shows. I mean, it's hard to imagine really how important a talk show could be back then. There when it was really just network television. Exactly. There's three channels. Everybody, you know, one thing I think I say in the book is that 1230 in 1982 was much later than 1230 is today. That if you're interested in irreverent comedy today at 1230, you have limitless options, streaming, internet, so many things you can do where – in 1982, at 1230, if you were interested in offbeat irreverent comedy, you were doing one thing. You were watching David Letterman. And also, you had to work to see him. You had to stay up late. I mean, I remember staying up past my bedtime to be able to see him. There was something a little dangerous about it. And in a weird way, I think that it had a kind of feeling of New York cool to me when I growing up outside of New York in a way that I think, I'm not sure quite exists in the same way, where a lot of people watch late night shows at noon or, you know, they watch clips of it. So he really created this one institution, late night, with they sort of reinvented it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, he he created a second at CBS, which now Colbert is at, The Late Show. You know, he, he of course, wanted The Tonight Show, that Johnny Carson mm-hmm. show. There was, a, you know, The Late Night War, which this paper covered thoroughly. When was the late night war? This is early 90s. This is 93 when the, when uh, Letterman left. And it was a huge story. So, you know, the biggest culture story of the time. And it was the first, in a w- weird way, the late night as a genre, I would argue, became bigger because of the late night war. Because people who had no interest in these shows were reading about them in, in the paper every day. And there was a real drama to them. And Jay versus Dave, who you liked, said something about who you are. Who was the Jay Leno person versus the David Letterman person? Well, you're asking a David Letterman person, so that's, it's, I mean, I'm probably biased on this, but I think the, in a nutshell, you know, Letterman person was kind of cooler. Of know, course. Right? Smarter. <laughs> more, more handsome. handsome. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's pretty, they were the perfect, the perfect person. Yeah, and, and Leno was more, I mean, Leno, first of all, I should say, was more popular. Letter, mm-hmm. Leno eventually beat him in the ratings. You're seeing this play out now with Fallon versus Colbert in a way, but it's kind of the reverse. But Leno, you know, wore denim and he was sort of aimed for middle America and he was more, you know, kind of a punchline artist. Right. Where Letterman, his, his jokes were kind of, kind of subverted the punchline were about the setup and the delivery and the tone and the attitude. So they also just aesthetically were completely different. Is that attitude what made it innovative or was there something else that, that made him so different from previous late night I think there's several things that made them innovative, but none more important than the attitude. And one thing I learned through reporting back in this book is how radical Letterman's brand of irony was in the 80s. He was not the first comedian to have this kind of ironic sense of humor, but he mainstreamed it in a way that had a huge impact on the culture and led to things like The Simpsons and Seinfeld. A pioneer of snark. Yes, Yes. And now I think it's, it's everywhere, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's on Twitter every day. It's everywhere in such a way that it's sort of hard to understand that when Letterman took over late night, it, you know, the tone of those shows was very show busy. It was, very, it was like a, uh, you know, it wasn't that far from kind of peppy morning show, but Carson had a kind of glamour to him. And Letterman sort of deconstructed the talk show in this way that has been done many times since then. Mm -hmm. But he had such a big impact that he was written about like he was like a public intellectual. David Foster Wallace, I read about in the book, hated Letterman the way only someone who loved him could. He thought that his brand of irony was dangerous. Uh, And his first published story in a major magazine was told from the point of view of an actress going on The Letterman Show. And it made it seem like this Letterman's this monstrous figure and how horrifying it was to be in this sarcastic, hostile environment. I'm interested to know the place of the late night host in culture at that time versus now, when, as you said, you kind of, you have to be up super late. That's reason number one. I never saw it. I was never awake at 1230. (laughs) Um, And if you missed it, you could read about it in the paper, but, you know, it wasn't like you could Google it and and find a clip, Right, right? right? Versus today when the shows in many ways seem to be created for the internet as much as they are for TV viewers. Yes. Were they bigger figures back then? I think the answer is definitely yes. And this is, I think, my the subtitle of my book might be controversial in 10 years from now. It may look self-evidently wrong, which is The Last Giant of Late Night. It's, I mean, it's an argumentative subtitle. And I, I would say that my defense of that has 
as much to do with the way the culture is organized as to do with Letterman's talents. One, there's a kind of fragmentation of the culture where we talked about how there's so many more options. Mm -hmm. But also, I think you put your finger on it, which is that the late night talk show was an hour long product. That was one unit of late night talk show. It was a cohesive whole. And now, clearly, as you say, these shows are designed to create viral videos that are, you know, five minutes, three minutes, that don't necessarily connect to the rest of the show. James Corden has has become a huge hit based on Carpool Karaoke, people who probably, many people have never seen the show, I'm sure. So the question is, what impact does that have on the art form? It's interesting. Everyone is now kind of obsessed with Letterman in retirement with the beard. Like, what does the beard mean? Did you, (laughs) does that symbolize this kind of retreat or this thinking of himself as the old man? I think it, yeah, I think it symbolizes a certain freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, he doesn't have to shave every morning. He doesn't put up makeup on. But I also think he actually had a big bushy beard in college. And I think at a time— It's a retreat to form. Yes, yes. Return to form. (laughs) Nobody else had that beard in his, you know, fraternity in Ball State. I I went there to reporting this book, and that stood out there as well. And, of course, beards meant something in the 60s as well. You know, he he told me that the more people dislike it, the more I want to keep it, which says something about the irreverence of his sensibility. Um, But he— Seems really, to me, I mean, what's interesting is he seems really happy now. I mean, he, has, he gave a speech recently at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He introduced, mm-hmm. he introduced Pearl Jam or inducted them into the Hall of Fame. And it was classic Letterman. I mean, he seemed really content with where he is. I, w- I would have guessed he would be doing a project by now, which he still might, but I also could see him just doing what he's doing now. Do you feel his absence in the culture? Like, do you think that there's a role for him somewhere that isn't being filled by someone else? Yes, I mean, the interesting thing about Letterman is that he's both tremendously influential and you can see aspects of his work in all the talk show hosts today, particularly when they try to do something a little uh, adventurous, and he's anomalous. You know, right now, all the talk show hosts, for the most part, particularly the network ones, are very ingratiating. They're kind of nice, likable types. That There's a kind of enforced likability. I find that so unlikable. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I, I share that. Yeah, I mean, I don't find like, I, I kind of feel like, imagine if... All of the hour-long dramas, we had to have likable protagonists. Right. We've gotten so used to having these wonderful, complex protagonists. Letterman was a complex protagonist. You could make a he could you could argue he's the anti-hero of late night. He was willing, he wanted to be liked too, of course, but he was willing to show anger and torment and a whole range of emotions that I think other talk show hosts today, even once we're doing wonderful work like Stephen Colbert, don't. So you interviewed him for the book, as you mentioned. Was this the first time that you'd interviewed him, or have you interviewed him on previous occasions? First time, first time. What was that like? I mean, it was stressful because I had to get so much accomplished in a short amount of time. I I sold the book on the idea that I wouldn't need an interview with him, which I think I was lying to myself, and I lied to myself for a long time. (laughs) But the good part of that is that I reported the hell out of this book around him. And so by the time he— Did you go to him at the very beginning and say, and you got a no back at first? I never got a no, but I never got a, I'll do it. And so I didn't know. It's one kind of book if you have a—if you interview him, it's another kind of book if you don't. So I sort of planned on the kind of book that if you didn't interview him, and then when I interviewed him, I was only supposed to get an hour— That is not a lot of time for a book. No, it's not. So—but he went four. Oh, and good. He would have. Mar- I feel more relieved. I feel relieved <laughs> on your behalf. Well, it's funny. The one regret it was a fantastic interview, and I learned a lot. One regret is that I wish I'd planned for eight. Because I, at that point, it was towards the end of the process. A lot of it was just. It was not a fishing expedition. I heard this, 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 and this. Is that true? So I had planned for an hour interview, so I pruned all these questions. When I realized he would have talked to me for however long I wanted, hmm. I was, it was great, but at the same time I was sort of like, okay, now I need to adjust on the fly. I also helped, I think, that it was, the show was over. He was relaxed. It was you know, nine months after the show had finished, and I think he was in the mood to talk. So you had this pressure to fit all this stuff into this little amount of time, and I imagine also – Meeting a childhood hero of yours, was that nerve-wracking? It's funny. That wasn't what was nerve-wracking. When I look back at the books, I've written a book on 70s horror films, Mm -hmm. and I've written a book on Dave Letterman, and they were both things that I loved as a little kid before I was a critic. And I don't think it's an accident that I've written books on those things. And or I, you're an enthusiast as much as a critic? Well, no. See, that's the thing. I think that the, the job as I see it when I wrote these books is to turn my fan brain off and mm-hmm. use the, the things that I've learned about criticism and reporting to approach these things that I loved as a kid. And when you do that, well, first of all, you lose a little something. 
and I know I've been a critic, you know, most of my life. You, you know, you, you approach something differently as a critic than you do as as a fan. I'm in this book, and I talk about my my love for Letterman as a kid, but I didn't want to write a fanboy book, and I don't consider that the best way to show respect for him either. So, you know, I've interviewed a lot of people, a lot of artists who I respect for my career, and it, it just felt like that. And I felt like, oh, I was just thrilled that for the book that I got to interview. You say you didn't want to write a fanboy book. What kind of book did you want to write? I wanted to write a book that really mixes criticism and reporting in a way that foregrounds the reporting so that people who don't know Letterman mm-hmm. will like it as much as people who are obsessive about it will like it. I wanted the, the, the criticism to be in there and to be embedded into this narrative nonfiction story about his life and career while also smuggling in criticism. And that was the biggest challenge. That was the part that I struggled with the most, the form of the book. And, you know, how much should my voice be in it? How much shouldn't it? And I went back and forth a lot. If I was to write a fanboy book, I would have put my voice in the forefront throughout. You obviously have been writing about Letterman for a long time and watched the show for many years. What surprised you most in either researching the book or in your interview with Letterman about the man himself? He is a, a very tormented guy for a lot of his career. I think he was being very honest on screen. And I think, you know, when I would talk to all these people who know, and I'd say, well, what was the happiest you ever saw David Letterman? There was always a long pause after that. He was in- intensely self-critical. And a lot of that, I guess, I when I going in, thought, I thought, well, maybe that's kind of pretend or that's for the press or something. But I think that's real. You know, he has, there's a kind of neuroses. I'm a Jewish guy from, who lives in New York. They, that's a particular kind of comedian neuroses. Mm-hmm. It's a different kind of neuroses for like a Midwestern guy from Indiana, a Gentile from Indiana, I should say. The, uh, <laughs> and, uh, but they, they share some things. And I think that to understand where a lot of his comedy comes from is how he transformed that into great humor, as a lot of comedians do. I guess the, 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 the final point of this is I think that what Letterman does is what all great artists do, which is that they reveal themselves through their work, is that he's not just telling jokes that anyone can tell. He's not just doing bits that have been done. By the end of his 33 years of work, I think a lot of people watching him every night from the living rooms feel like they really deeply know this person. And he was ultimately, even though he's a guarded guy, vulnerable in a way that I think only makes his accomplishment more impressive. All right. One final question, both for fans and for Letterman neophytes alike. If you were to advise people to go out and kind of Google one Letterman clip that kind of exemplifies for you what makes him so special, what should they put in their search terms? That's a tough one. That's what should we really all hunt down? Because now I want to. You've, you've, <laughs> you've won me over here. <laughs> this I don't know if this is the one that typically, but but this is one that's close to my heart, which is he did a remote. And I think a lot of you asked before, what, what, what did he pioneer? One is that turning edited remote videos of ordinary people on the street mm-hmm. into comedy, which is something you see every day at The Daily Show. He has a one early on, and these were produced by his then girlfriend, Meryl Marco, who deserves a lot of credit for his success, called Just Bulbs. Where he there's a story, it's still around actually. I think there was a story about it recently. They they're called Just Bulbs in New York. And he goes to uh this store and he basically plays dumb and says, like, I'm looking for a a lampshade. And uh-huh. they're like, No, no, this is just bulbs. <laughs> <laughs> and then he plays that out and then it goes on from there. And he turns this like very simple, ordinary thing into just something really hilarious. All right. Easy Google, just bulbs and letterman. Jason, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I had a great time. The book, again, is Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night by Jason Zinneman. This is John Williams, and I am joined by Jenny Schusler, a reporter here at The Times, who has news from the literary world. Hi, Jenny. Hey, John. How are you? I'm good. So you wrote this week about very big news involving James Baldwin. Let's get to just sort of quickly what the news itself is. Well, the big news is that the Schomburg Center, which is a division of the New York Public Library in Harlem, kind of one of the world's leading, probably the world's leading archive for material relating to African people globally, acquired the archives of James Baldwin. And what's interesting about this is this is a complete sort of life, what they call a life archive of Baldwin. So it's manuscripts, notes, outlines, drafts, letters, material relating to all of his books covering his decades-long career. Mm -hmm. And it had all been held by his family all of this time. 
and very few scholars had ever been allowed to see it. Hmm. And now it is in a publicly accessible archive because the great thing about the New York Public Library is that anybody, you don't have to be a professor, a researcher, a biographer, anybody can go in and view their collections. And you were up in Harlem last night at the Schomburg Center for the announcement. Can you describe a little bit about what that scene was like? And did people know that this is what the announcement was going to be? No, there was a, people were told there was going to be a special announcement. It was a, it was a fete to celebrate, among other things, the arrival of the new director of the Schomburg, Kevin Young, the poet. And so everybody went into the auditorium. There was this nice program. And then Tony Marks, the director of the library, gets up and announces, like, we have the papers of James Baldwin. And I think, like, half the room gasped. And then there were just, you know, these huge cheers and applause. And I think there is this real feeling of homecoming because, you know, Baldwin was born and grew up in Harlem. And, you know, now he, now he's back. Let's go to the start of your article because it, it, the first sentence is striking. You, you write, James Baldwin died in 1987, but his moment is now. What did you mean by that? Well, I, you sort of feel like he's everywhere. I don't know if you've seen Raul Peck's really fantastic documentary, I Am Not Your Negro. I did. Very powerful, yes. nominated for an Academy Award. James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time was sort of an inspiration for ta Coates's memoir, Between the World and Me. And did mm-hmm. you just see Baldwin quoted everywhere? I think yes. there's this feeling that he's really speaking to our moment and all of the things he wrote about are things that are happening now. And he is this kind of essential prophetic voice who's really become a touchstone for all sorts of people. And so let's get back to the archive. Was this a deal long in negotiation with the Schomburg Center? These things are always sort of shrouded in a bit of secrecy. I I can imagine virtually any top institution would have loved to have these papers. I think there was a lot of wrangling that went on for many years. The price is one of those things that's in secrecy. You know, safe to say millions, safe to say millions, but shrouded in secrecy, you know, very valuable And yeah, I think there were some pretty complex negotiations. One thing that was kind of striking that I focused on my article is that literary estates are often, um, you know, their families, their descendants. So it's very personal for them. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be hard for them to part with this material. It can be hard for them to sort of put things that, you know, may seem very private or sensitive Mm -hmm. into the public eye. And there's always a lot of wrangling over restrictions on access. And generally, archives don't like to agree to restrictions because their whole purpose is to make things useful to scholars and to the public. And in this case, the library did agree to a 20-year seal on Baldwin's personal correspondence with four of his closest intimates, including his brother David. And so biographers have really been clamoring to see this because you can't really write a good biography unless you have that sort of personal voice. For someone like me, who I actually have a, a fairly substantial shelf at home of, of writers' letters and, mm, and books, mm-hmm. in addition to biographers, is it something where after 20 years, publishers could maybe work with the Schomburg Center to put out a volume of, of Baldwin's letters? Well, the the Schomburg Center wouldn't be involved. It's really the estate retains the rights. And it has been hugely frustrating to a lot of biographers, critics, just literary admirers that they haven't been able to read Baldwin's letters. The great Hilton Alls, the New York critic for The New Yorker who won a Pulitzer this week, has sort of wrote a very passionate essay about the, the frustrations of this and how the, the, he said, really, the lost masterpiece, the unpublished masterpiece by Baldwin is his letters. Mm. You know, and he said, these are letters the family doesn't want you to read. I did speak to one scholar, Ed Pavlik, who's a poet and a professor at the University of Georgia, who did win the trustee of the estate about six or seven years ago. He was allowed to see about 120 letters that Baldwin wrote to David, his older brother, to whom he was extremely close. He was invited to sort of write a book about them, try to try to find a sort of story to tell about them. He told me they're absolutely fantastic letters. He prepared a manuscript. He sent it to the estate asking for permission to quote. They never even responded. Oh, so. That that book is limbo. He did write a really wonderful essay about the letters without quoting any of them in the Boston <laughs> Review. But it sort of gives you a glimpse of what might be there. And I should say, you know, I was not able to speak to the the executor or the family. They're very private. You know, they have their own reasons. I don't know what they are. But in 20 years, you will be able to go to the Schomburg and read these. What does this mean most short term for, you know, fans and admirers of his? Is there a, an, an exhibit planned or can you go to the Schomburg and sort of see, you know, very vital things that aren't the letters? What does it mean for someone, and when can they go and look at it? Anyone can go look at it as a researcher. And there's a very small pop-up exhibition of maybe eight or ten items from the archive and some photographs. It is in the lobby of the Schomburg Center. It's really quite fascinating and tantalizing. You should run up there. (laughs) But another sort of odd aspect of this is one of the things the library agreed to in the acquisition is no public display of 
pretty much any other materials from the archives for seven years, which is, <laughs> I, I don't know what explains that. So there won't, sadly, there will not be a, a huge Baldwin exhibition. Yeah. You can, having seen probably about 20% of the archive, you could do, there would be a fantastic exhibition and many people would rush up there to see it. Right now, there's a really great exhibition in their gallery about the Black Power Movement. And you can just imagine something yeah. that similar about Baldwin. But this is a hurry up and wait story. I do want to emphasize that you, John Williams, can file a request to the Schomburg to go in as a researcher, go into the reading room, look at the materials. Anybody can do that. Okay. But that takes a little bit more work. And I, I would recommend you do it because I have to say this, I want to underline this is a fantastic archive. It's really dense, as uh, you know, scholars like to say. There's just all sorts of you know, unpublished screenplays, drafts of all of his novels. One kind of amazing thing I saw was a, a teleplay, I think it was, sort of a screen television screenplay adaptation of Giovanni's Room, his great 1956 mm-hmm. novel. You know, I had no idea he had done this adaptation. Nothing ever came of it. But it's, it's really fascinating. Well, maybe I'll get up there. Thanks, John. Go! Thanks, John. the spring break edition of what we're reading with a smaller crew here, John Williams and Parl Sagel. Join us now. Hi, guys. Hey, Pamela. Hey, Pamela. All right. Let's start with uh, you, Parl. You're flipping through a book with illustration. I am. I am reading this week Bento Sketchbook by John Berger, a book that I have pretended to have read for many years. <laughs> um, I love John Berger, and I just had never gotten around to this one, and which is so strange because in certain ways it's his friendliest book. It's a book about sketching. It's a book about his sort of lifetime obsession with drawing and where does the impulse to draw begin. And uh, it's just a really beautiful book about seeing. And if people, you know, have read any John Berger, he wrote this very influential book called Ways of Seeing. And he's an art critic. And I guess you can call him an activist and a fiction writer. And I is mean... It, is it filled with sketches? It's filled well with some of his sketches, writing. right. Like, so he, he writes, he sort of like toggles between it some philosophies. It would be a kind of problematic title if it didn't contain any sketches. I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, he, he sort of moves between... Just drawing really like pedestrian things, you would think, just, you know, a handful of flowers or a neighbor's face. He includes some of his like granddaughter's drawings. But it's it's sort of this, again, this investigation into what we see, what we pay attention to, and the fact that, you know, our lives are more or less what we try to look at and what we make ourselves look at every day. So it's very, it's very profound, but without, you know, I'm making it sound very ponderous, but it's very sweet and smart. And if you're looking for something that sort of slows you down, which I think I've been needing. I've just been reading mm-hmm. a lot and writing a lot. Like, And I just wanted something that mm. was a little bit more meditative and a little bit of a, like a, again, I keep using this word like lately with books, but a palate cleanse or something to just sort of reset. <laughs> yeah, I know. But like, I guess I, you have been using that phrase. I'm constantly, yeah, in need of like control alt deleting, you know, mm-hmm. like just like resetting things and, and stopping and just sort of like um, reading a bit slower, looking a little bit you know, with more intention. And it's, it's, it's really, it's really quite good. It feels like the palate just can't be cleansed. No matter how hard you try (laughs) these days. It's just, I keep trying to watch relaxing TV and things and it's just not working. I have the thing where I, it's not that I need a palate cleanser right now, although sometimes I do, but I keep needing like a rewind button where if I'm reading too much contemporary stuff, Mm -hmm. I need to like go back a hundred to 200 years. <laughs> no, and it's my theory about this. And I, John, I really did like the palate cannot be cleansed. Um, my theory is that I think that in, in certain ways, I, like, I feel this way with music. I'm always trying to go back and listen to music the way I used to listen to it in my teens. You know, and it just felt a certain way and it yeah. sounded a certain way. And I think that maybe like this platonic ideal of reading too, when we were just, maybe it was in college for some people or before that. For me, mm-hmm. grad school was certainly like part of that where you just, you know, you'd read until your eyes burned. You know, I'd um, say music was a little earlier for me, but reading, mm-hmm. yeah, 19 to 22 or so was yeah. the peak. Yeah. What are you reading? I'm actually reading. <laughs> You're very familiar with what I'm reading <laughs> because you spoke about it very eloquently on last week's podcast. The influential Carl Siegel. Yes. I cuddled and, you with the book later and said, you have to read it because I need to talk about it more. You did. I was not allowed to get up from my desk. Um, and you also wrote a wonderful essay about it in last week's book review. And it's a very, very slender Indian novel called Gachar Gochar by... Vivek Schoenbog. And I won't get into it too much because you described it so well last week. It's a very quiet story of a family and their sort of economic fortunes and a father and his brother who who kind of start a new business. But it, what really struck me and got me 
fully immersed in it on just page 11 was this sentence that says, what can I say? It is one of the strengths of families to pretend that they desire what is unavoidable. And I just thought that they it just totally had me in its in its grip then. And then um, the other thing that I'm sort of starting to dip into this week is Elif Bachman's The Possessed, a collection of essays subtitled Adventures with Russian Books and the People Who Read Them. And she's a very talented writer, writes for The New Yorker and other places, and she has a big novel out this year called The Idiot, which Parl also just reviewed in the book review, also a very lovely piece. And The Idiot is very close to the top of my pile, but the Possessed is a book that people really love and that I read, I think, a couple of pieces in when it first came out. But now I want to sort of more meticulously go through the whole thing. And it starts with a sentence about The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. And that led me to remember that I'm only about a third of the way through that book. It's one of my big, my big projects this year. I will read year. that book with you, but John. I can't find it. Oh, I've, no. I've turned I've my apartment upside copies. down. I have <laughs> one of my copies, too, that well, I've been I neglecting that. I've already marked years. up the first 150 pages. I have to find it. And I will. Well, you know what's funny is that I was reading The Possessed and I left it. When the Dostoevsky or the Bachman? No, I was reading the Bachman, visiting a friend from college in Rhode Island, and I left it there, and I never finished it. I sort of took this very zen approach to it, like I, yeah. I was enjoying it, it was really good, and yet it was meant to be left there, and I and I <laughs> left it behind, and I've moved on. Not that I wasn't enjoying it. No, it's a very I, healthy state of mind yes. that, that does that. Well, it <laughs> it I, do, I, I do not possess the possessed <laughs> any longer. <laughs> but speaking of like talking about golden ages of reading, this mm-hmm. is a book that is all about the adventures of reading in grad school. Um, and it's one of the few books, I don't know if you've ever felt like this, but when I read certain critics, I feel... I feel envious. I'm like, she's a better reader. You know, how do you read <laughs> oh, that sure, deeply? I'll feel that how way, do you yes. pay that much attention? Oh, she's so that good. describes my entire college experience. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Pamela? What are you reading? So I'm reading the book that I started last week, Emile Zola's The Belly of Paris. And um, I talked a little bit about the preface last week. I'm, I've gotten a little bit further along. And the most enjoyable aspect of it to me personally is that it takes place in Laal, which is the area where I lived when I lived in Paris on the border of Laal. And and the Marais, the street that I lived on, Rue Rambuteau, is featured prominently in the book. Wow. And the second French book that, that it's been in, it was also in Les Miserables, much more briefly. And it's funny, it's very different. I think I talked about this last week from Germinal, the only other Zola novel that I've read, in that at least thus far, it doesn't seem to be a sort of a social activist novel. I think that it's going to get there. And it's in there in terms of Florent's experience as someone who was wrongly imprisoned and exiled. We should say you're reading it in French, yes? I am not reading it in French. Oh, okay. I got it mixed up last week. No, I've actually been chastised by French friends for not reading it in French. But again, my my allotment of sleep these days does not allow (laughs) for reading in the native tongue. What do they say? Is he a complicated writer in French? No, no. I mean, he's not a great stylist. He's a realist writer. There are no romantic flourishes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in fact, one of the difficulties about reading it in French is that I would imagine that there's a lot of specifics in terms of, I mean, when he describes the fish market, he's naming 30 different species of (laughs) fish. And I think I would probably be lost at around species number four. So I can't say yet that I'm loving it, Mm -hmm. but it's, it's definitely interesting. All right. Well, we'll we'll check back on your enthusiasm next week. Yes. Maybe something very dramatic will take place. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, inshallah. All right. Thanks, Thanks John. Thanks, Thanks, Carl. Remember, there's more at nytimes.com slash books. And you can always write to us at books at nytimes.com. Inside the New York Times Book Review is produced by Pedro Rosado. Thanks for listening. For the New York Times, I'm Pamela Paul. Mm-hmm.